Hello, I'm Miss Ginsburg with No Adam, and today we're going to be reading Climate and Human Activity. This is a lab manual in Unit 4. Section 1, Earth, the Water Planet. Studying the ocean's saltiness. Since 2011, a satellite called Aquarius has been orbiting Earth from 644 kilometers or 400 miles above the surface. Its mission has been to gather data about the salinity in the surface water. Salinity is the measure of all the salts dissolved in water. If you've ever gone swimming in the ocean and accidentally swallowed some water, you've tasted how salty the ocean is. For hundreds of years, scientists physically measured the salinity of different parts of the ocean from ships and buoys. This provided limited data, however. Some parts of the ocean were much harder for scientists to reach and measure than others. In response to this problem, a team of about 100 scientists and engineers developed and launched the Aquarius satellite in 2011. The Aquarius satellite improves on older methods of gathering data because it continuously monitors and collects data on ocean salinity around the planet. Understanding the ocean salinity, including how that salinity differs around the world and changes over time, is essential for scientists who want to understand the movement of water around the planet. This in turn has major implications for weather and climate. Weather is the conditions of the atmosphere, temperature, humidity, wind speed, and precipitation at the particular place and time. Climate is the average weather in a location over 30 years or more. How oceans get salty. Understanding salinity first begins with an understanding of how oceans become salty. Oceans become salty because of interactions among different earth systems. Remember that a system is a set of connected, interacting parts that form a more complex whole. Systems have inputs and outputs. Inputs are what are received by the system. Outputs are what are sent from the system. Earth has four primary systems that are interconnected, constantly interacting with and influencing one another. The hydrosphere, atmosphere, biosphere, and geosphere. For example, all of the water on Earth forms an Earth system called the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere includes all of the ice, liquid water, and water vapor on Earth. It is constantly interacting with another Earth system called the atmosphere. The atmosphere is the mixture of gases, dust, water vapor, and other molecules above Earth's crust. One of the gases in the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. When water falls to Earth's surface as rain, it carries some of this carbon dioxide, making the water slightly acidic. This slightly acidic water breaks down the rocks on Earth's surface into smaller particles, including salt and other minerals. This is an interaction between the hydrosphere and the geosphere, the Earth system made up of Earth's landforms, including mountains, valleys, soil, and sediment. All water that collects on Earth's surface will eventually flow downhill to the oceans because of the pull of Earth's gravity. As water flows downhill, it carries with it the particles of salt and other matter. All water eventually ends up in the ocean, where it deposits the salt and other matter. Over millions of years, this salt has built up in the oceans, creating the salt water of the oceans. Salt water is a mixture. Salt water is a mixture. This means that it is made up of two or more pure substances that are mixed together but not chemically bonded. Salt water is made up of different kinds of chemicals that make it salty. The most common is salt, which is a molecule made up of one sodium ion and one chlorine ion. A sodium ion forms when a sodium atom loses one electron. A chloride ion forms when a chlorine atom gains an electron. Water is a molecule made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Because salt water is a mixture, the parts that make it up can be separated. Imagine you leave a cup of salt water on a table next to a sunny window. Over time, the water will evaporate, leaving behind the salt. This is because salt cannot evaporate in the same way the water does. Evaporation is the process of liquid water changing into water vapor, its gas state. 
water evaporates when enough thermal energy is present. Like all liquids, the atoms and molecules that make up liquid water are less tightly packed than they are in a solid. They are in constant contact with one another, but they have enough energy to slide past one another. This is why matter in a liquid state takes the shape of its container, but has no shape of its own. When thermal energy is added to liquid water, the atoms and molecules begin to speed up. When enough thermal energy is added, the atoms or molecules will move so quickly that the water expands, becoming a gas called water vapor. The water cycle. This is what happens to a cup of salt water on a sunny day. The sun produces energy through exothermic chemical reactions. That solar energy is then transferred to Earth through radiation, heat transfer that occurs without contact between the heat source and the object heated. The transfer of energy causes Earth's atmosphere to heat up as solar energy transforms to thermal energy that is absorbed by air molecules. Thermal energy is then transferred to the cup and then to the water molecules through conduction, heat transfer that occurs when molecules collide. When enough thermal energy is transferred to the water in the cup, those water molecules speed up so much that the water becomes a gas and evaporates. Remember heat transfer. Those water molecules are now carrying thermal energy as they move into the atmosphere. Now think about the cup of salt water representing the global ocean. Earth is constantly being warmed by the sun. Through radiation, energy is transferred from the sun to Earth's atmosphere and landforms, as well as its oceans, rivers, lakes, and other sources of water on Earth's surface. Land areas and the atmosphere absorb some sunlight, but the majority of the sun's radiation is absorbed by the ocean. When enough thermal energy is transferred to the ocean water, liquid water will evaporate into the atmosphere, carrying thermal energy and leaving behind the salt molecules. Once water evaporates from Earth's surface, it moves into the atmosphere. There is always water in the atmosphere. About 90% comes from evaporation from bodies of water. The other 10% comes from plant transpiration, the process of water moving through plants from their roots to their leaves, where it is released back to the atmosphere as water vapor. Water vapor in the atmosphere transfers some of its thermal energy to the cooler atmosphere. This causes it to cool off and condense, turning back into liquid water. Drops of water join together and attach to particles such as dust or pollen, forming clouds. When the cloud gets heavy enough, precipitation will occur. Precipitation is water falling back to Earth's surface in the form of rain, snow, sleet, or hail. Some of that water is absorbed into the ground as groundwater. Some is absorbed by the biosphere, the Earth system made up of all living things on Earth, including plants, through their roots and animals when they drink. The rest of the water collects on Earth's surface in the ocean, lakes, and rivers, where it moves downhill, pulled by the force of Earth's gravity. When enough thermal energy from the sun warms water on Earth's surface, it evaporates back into the atmosphere. When living things die and their bodies decompose, the water they've stored in their bodies return to Earth's surface. This circulation of water through the hydrosphere from Earth's surface to the atmosphere and back is called the water cycle. The water cycle is hugely influenced by interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean. Oceans are constantly exchanging energy and matter with the atmosphere. 86% of all water evaporation and 78% of all precipitation occurs over the ocean. This, in turn, plays a major role in weather and climate. Evaporation increases the temperature and humidity of the surrounding air. This then causes rain and storms that are carried by winds around the planet. The water cycle is complex. It varies in different parts of the world and at different times of year, depending on the amount of thermal energy available. For example, most of the fresh water on Earth is stored in glaciers and ice caps, where it can remain frozen for thousands of years. The process of water freezing into solid ice is called crystallization. In contrast, in hot climates and seasons, precipitation sometimes evaporates just seconds after it falls to Earth's surface. These differences can be understood partly by Earth's position and movement in the solar system relative to the sun. 
First, Earth is tilted 23.5 degrees on its axis. As a result of this tilt, the sun's rays shine directly onto the planet around the equator. The sun's rays are the most concentrated here, which causes temperatures to be high. This results in ocean water that is hot enough to quickly evaporate into water vapor and condense into large clouds. Moving north or south of the equator, the sun's rays are spread over a larger area, so each square meter of Earth's surface receives less solar energy. As a result, these regions have lower temperatures, which results in more water being stored as ice for longer periods of time. Earth's tilt and movement around the sun also affects the water cycle because it determines seasonal changes. A season is a period of time characterized by specific weather patterns and by the length of day and night. Earth fully orbits the sun once every 365.25 days. For half of the year, Earth's north pole is tilted towards the sun. This results in summer in the north and winter in the south. For the other half of the year, Earth's north pole is tilted away from the sun. This results in winter in the north and summer in the south. The point when the north pole is in between a full tilt to toward or away from the sun creates the seasons of spring and fall. Each season has similar patterns of weather in specific locations. In tropical and polar climates, the weather is relatively consistent throughout the year. Tropical climates are warm and humid throughout the year. Close to the equator, there are only two seasons, a wet season and a dry season. The wet season lasts most of the year and is called the wet season because of how much it rains. Polar climates are cold throughout the year. Regions with polar climates cover 20% of the planet. Polar climates often result in few trees with glaciers or a permanent or semi-permanent layer of ice. In contrast, in temperate zones, the weather changes with the four seasons, fall, winter, spring, and summer. Temperatures begin to decrease in the fall and days become shorter because these regions are tilting away from the sun. Winter has short days, long nights, and cold temperatures. It gets warmer during the spring because Earth's orbit causes these regions to tilt more toward the sun. The days start to get longer and temperatures begin to warm up. As Earth continues its orbit, summer arrives to the part of Earth directly facing the sun. Because Earth's tilt causes this region to tilt toward the sun, summer is also the hottest season. Earth's varied surfaces also result in uneven heating. For example, the surface of blacktop on a newly paved road gets very hot during the summer. Its dark color makes it a strong absorber, so little of the sun's energy is reflected away. Instead, that energy is absorbed as thermal energy. This causes the road to become hotter. In contrast, the polar ice caps act like mirrors. They reflect a large amount of energy from the sun back into space. This results in minimal heating of the surface and lower atmosphere. Ice is the world's largest supply of fresh water and covers 3% of Earth's surface. As ice melts, it becomes liquid water. Liquid water absorbs more thermal energy than ice. Therefore, as ice caps and glaciers melt, Earth's temperature becomes warmer because there is less ice to reflect the sun's heat. Earth's ability to reflect the sun's light is called albedo. Albedo is influenced by the color, type, and texture of various surfaces. Snow-covered land, forests, oceans, polar ice caps, and cities all reflect energy from the sun differently. This is because dark colored surfaces, such as oceans and forests, reflect very little solar energy, similar to blacktop roads. Light colored surfaces of the planet, such as snow and ice, reflect almost all solar energy. This is why the edges of snow next to an exposed patch of earth or concrete melt faster. The white snow reflects the sun's radiation, while the darker earth absorbs it, heating up as a result. In the map below, the colors show the albedo over Earth's land surfaces, ranging point from 0 to 0.81. Reds and oranges show surfaces that reflect a lot of light. These surfaces have albedo. Blues show surfaces that absorb more light. These surfaces have low albedo. Yellow and green show surfaces that absorb some light and reflect some light. Ocean density. The variations of the water cycle around the planet caused by Earth's tilt, orbit, and albedo, play a significant role in the differing amounts of salt in the world's oceans. 
When ocean water freezes into ice or evaporates, the remaining ocean becomes saltier because there is less liquid water relative to the amount of salt. This causes the salt water to become denser. Remember that density is the measure of the amount of mass in a given volume. The more tightly packed the molecules of a substance are, the denser they are because they have more mass in a given space than do materials that are less dense. The more salt there is packed into the water, the denser the water is. In contrast, precipitation decreases the salinity of ocean water. This is because precipitation is always fresh water. So when it falls into the ocean, it dilutes the salt concentration. Because of this, parts of the ocean that receive a lot of rain, either year round or during rainy seasons, often have low salinity. Similarly, rivers are fresh water. So areas of the ocean that are near mouths of rivers that empty fresh water into the ocean are less salty. Both of these inputs of fresh water decrease the salinity and make the water less dense. The temperature of water also affects its density. High temperatures make water less dense. As water gets warmer, its molecules spread out, so it becomes less dense. As it gets colder, it becomes denser. Another factor that affects the density of ocean water is depth. The deepest parts of the ocean are also the densest because of the weight of water above pushing down. Why salinity matters. Ray Schmidt is the lead scientist on a scientific mission that is using data from the Aquarius satellite. Schmidt has long been fascinated by salt in the ocean. He was one of the first scientists to recognize how important the ocean is in the water cycle. In 2012, Schmidt and a team of scientists set sail for the world's saltiest patch of open ocean water, located halfway between the Bahamas and the western coast of North Africa. Scientists say this spot is similar to a desert on land where there is a little rainfall and a lot of evaporation. Data suggests that this spot of ocean is actually becoming saltier over time. The scientists on board the ship stay for three weeks, taking measurements on the ocean salinity, temperature, and other factors. They used many different kinds of scientific tools, including floats, gliders, drifters, moorings, ships, satellites, and computer models. One of the reasons that scientists care about the variations in ocean salinity is that they play a major role in deep ocean currents. Ocean currents are paths of flowing ocean water that push warm and cold water to different parts of the planet. Cold, dense water in the oceans sink deep and spreads out all around the world. The sinking water is replaced by the warm, less dense water near the surface that moves to the north. Scientists call this the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. Math check. Calculating density. The density of an object is calculated by dividing the object's mass by its volume. This is the equation. Density equals mass over volume. Density of a solid. Follow the steps below to find the density of the cube shown below. Step one, find the mass of the cube by using a digital scale or triple beam balance. The digital scale shows that its mass is 25.4 grams. Step two, Find the volume of the cube by multiplying its length, width, and height. For example, 4 times 4 times 4 equals 64 centimeters cubed. Step 3, calculate density. Note, change the units to match what you are dividing. For example, instead of kilograms per meter cubed, the cube is measured in grams per centimeters cubed. If you use a graduated cylinder to measure volume, the units for density would be grams over milliliters or grams over liters. A graduated cylinder can measure the volume of an object by water displacement. Section two, understanding climate. Analyzing Earth from Space. One day in July 2005, far above Earth's surface, a satellite named Aqua was collecting data on the complex interactions that drive the water cycle, focusing on interactions between the energy produced by the sun and water on Earth. From its perch in space, Aqua gathers information about evaporation from the oceans, water vapor in the atmosphere, clouds, precipitation, 
soil moisture, sea ice, land ice, and snow cover on the land and ice. One area where it is gathering data is Cape Verde, a group of 10 islands near the equator. In July 2005, temperatures were very high. Aqua recorded the moment when the ocean's surface reached a critical temperature, 27 degrees Celsius, or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. At this temperature, ocean water begins to evaporate. Aqua collected data showing that millions of tons of water vapor evaporated from the ocean every hour. Scientists could then track the movement of that water and the resulting weather it caused around the planet. The data from the satellites provide evidence that water is constantly in motion in water vapor and in ocean currents. The warm ocean water and water vapor produced at the equator continually carry the sun's energy towards the poles. This is significant because the transfer of heat around the planet regulates Earth's climate. Without it, regions near the equator would be much hotter, while regions near the poles would be much colder. Heat exchange between ocean and atmosphere. Remember that molecules of water vapor carry thermal energy. As those molecules spread out into the atmosphere, they begin to transfer some of that energy into the atmosphere, which is cooler. This occurs because heat is always transferred from warmer substances to cooler substances until equilibrium is reached. This transfer of heat causes the water vapor to cool off, condensing back into liquid water and forming clouds. The condensation transfers heat to the atmosphere, which warms the cooler air. This causes the warmed air to rise, making space for more humid, warmer air from the ocean below. As the cycle of heat transfer between the ocean and the atmosphere continues, more wet, warm air is drawn upward, and more heat is transferred from the ocean to the atmosphere. This transfer of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere is what powers storm systems that are then carried around the planet by wind. If enough clouds are drawn upward, Earth's rotation causes them to spin. This is the beginning of a hurricane. Hurricanes are storm systems with strong thunderstorms and sustained winds of 119 to more than 252 kilometers per hour. Hurricanes are fueled by heat from warm water. Because of this, they grow stronger when there is warm, moist air, which is found over tropical oceans because of evaporation. When they reach cooler water or land, they weaken because there isn't enough heat to fuel their growth. Scientists who track storms know that hurricanes also move from east to west because they are pushed by global winds that push them in this direction. Wind is moving air. All wind is caused by the same process that powers deep ocean currents. Air moves from high pressure to low pressure areas, similar to how high pressure air rushes from the mouth of an inflated balloon when you let go. As air is heated, its density decreases as its molecules spread out and move up. As air cools, its density increases, causing it to sink. There are two categories of wind, local winds and global winds. Local winds travel over very short distances and can change often. Sea breezes and mountain breezes are both examples of local winds. Global winds are large area masses. An air mass is a large body of air that has a similar temperature and humidity throughout. Global winds move around the entire planet and they are created by Earth's rotation, Earth's shape, and the uneven heating of Earth's surface. In the Northern Hemisphere, the sun warms the air around the equator. That warm air rises and flow flows towards the North Pole as heat moves from the warm region to cooler regions. However, because Earth rotates around its axis, the air doesn't travel in a straight line. Instead, it is pushed into curved paths. This is called the Cor Coriolis effect. Because of the Coriolis effect, the warm air in the northern hemisphere is pushed to the right, northeast. A similar wind pattern happens in the southern hemisphere, but opposite. Because of the Coriolis effect, the warm air is pushed to the left, southeast. Because these winds blow from the west to the east in both hemispheres, they are called westerlies. The trade winds are the prevailing wind pattern within the tropical region on Earth. 
These winds blow from the north toward the equator in the northern hemisphere and from the south toward the equator in the southern hemisphere. Trade winds blow from east to west in both hemispheres, and they are responsible for pushing hurricanes from east to west. These global winds, both the trade winds and the westerlies, also push against the ocean's surface. This creates surface ocean currents that move in a clockwise spiral in the northern hemisphere in a counterclockwise spiral in the southern hemisphere. The ocean currents are also affected by the outlines of Earth's continents as they transport heat from the equator to the poles. Global patterns, local climate. As oceans and air currents carry heat, they influence the climate of the land. As Gulf Stream, as the Gulf Streams offers a good example of how the water, air, and land interact to influence climate. The Gulf Stream is an ocean current that flows eastward from the Gulf of Mexico, around the southern tip of Florida, and along the east coast up to Iceland and Norway. It is like a warm river that moves over and through the colder waters of the Atlantic Ocean. As it travels north, the warm water in the Gulf Stream cools off because of evaporation caused by wind moving over the water. That evaporation results in water that is saltier and denser. By the time the water reaches the North Atlantic Ocean, the water is so dense that it begins to sink down through less salty and less dense water. Here, it joins another current that moves south toward warmer, less dense water, continuing the cycle of water around the planet. Florida's climate is influenced by the Gulf Stream, as well as the state's location relative to the equator. Remember that different parts of Earth receive different amounts of sunlight because of Earth's tilt. Regions that are closest to the equator receive the most direct sunlight and so have the warmest temperatures. Regions that are closest to the poles receive the least amount of direct sunlight and so have the coolest temperatures. Scientists measure a location's position relative the, to the equator as its latitude. The equator's latitude is zero degrees, while the pole's latitude is 90 degrees. South Florida has a latitude of around 60 degrees north of the equator. In addition to its latitude, South Florida's climate is also affected by its location next to the warm ocean water. The ocean has the effect of keeping temperatures warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer than other southeastern states. This results in what scientists called a marine climate. This is because of how heat always moves from warmer regions to cooler regions, seeking, seeking equilibrium. The ocean has a higher heat capacity than land. Heat capacity is the energy required to raise the temperature. In other words, it takes longer for water to heat and cool than the land. Let's think about South Florida again. South Florida, and all of the United States, is in the Northern Hemisphere. Summer occurs when the North Pole is tilted toward the sun. This causes temperatures to increase. As the sun heats Earth, the land becomes warmer before the ocean does because the ocean has a higher heat capacity. As a result, heat transfers from the warmer land and the air above the land to the cooler ocean. This transfer of energy, or heat, from the land to the ocean causes the land's temperature to decrease. When it is winter in South Florida, the North Pole is tilted away from the sun. This causes temperatures to be lower. The land gets colder than the ocean, again because of the ocean's heat capacity. Now, heat transfers in the opposite direction, from the ocean to the land. This causes the land to warm up more than it would without the ocean. In contrast, Locations that aren't near the ocean tend to have more extreme temperatures, both warmer and colder, because this heat transfer with the ocean doesn't occur. Effects of landforms on climate. Now imagine that you travel directly east or west from South Florida, but remain at the same latitude. You would quickly notice that the climate varies wildly. For example, the Himalaya Mountains are also located around 26 north. However, it is not uncommon for temperatures to reach negative 37 degrees Celsius or negative 34.6 degrees Fahrenheit. This can be explained partly by their elevation, which is the height of a location above sea level. Areas at higher elevations generally have lower average temperatures than do areas of lower elevations. This is because air pressure decreases as the altitude increases. 
At sea level, Earth's atmosphere is pressing against each square inch of you with a force of one kilogram per square centimeter, or 14.7 pounds per square inch. The higher the pressure of a gas, such as air, is, the more thermal energy it has. Low air pressure makes the atmosphere less able to absorb and retain heat. Therefore, as you climb higher, air temperature decreases. Typically, air temperature decreases about negative 16 degrees Celsius or 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet of elevation. Also at 26 North lies a city in India, Cherapunji, that is semi-tropical climate. It also has the world record for most rainfall in a year, 26,461 millimeters, millimeters, yeah, or 1,042 inches. This record amount of rain occurs because of interactions between the water cycle and the geography of the region. The rains that fall on Cherapunji begin in the Bay of Bengal. Just like the water cycle happening all over the planet, the ocean water is heated by the sun, causing water vapor to evaporate into the atmosphere. As it evaporates, it carries heat with it. As it rises, the water vapor condenses, transferring heat to the air and becoming liquid water again as it forms clouds. Those clouds move over the country of Bangladesh, which is mostly plains, relatively flat land. Because there are no large hills or other barriers, the clouds move straight through. Then, the clouds run into a mountain range called the Khasi Hills, which rise above the plains. These hills have valleys between them, and wind pushes the clouds through the valleys and up the steep slopes. As the clouds rise higher, condensation continues as the water molecules continue to transfer heat to the atmosphere. This results in the extreme rainfall over Cherapunji. The land on the other side of the hills receive much less rainfall because the clouds carrying the rain rarely move past the Kasi Hills. Analyzing data to make predictions. Scientists call meteorologists. Scientists called meteorologists take everything they know about the water cycles, global processes, as well as lo local elevation, altitude, and geography to make predictions about future weather conditions. In addition to the satellites orbiting Earth, there are also thousands of weather stations positioned around the world, constantly gathering data about the weather. Weather stations include temperature sensors, wind gouges, and rain collectors. As a result of all of these stations, more than 1 million weather-related observations are made every single day. Those calculations all feed into supercomputers that perform millions of calculations every second in an effort to predict weather conditions over time. It is these predictions that most weather channels and meteorologists around the country use in their weather forecasts. And yet, despite the many weather stations around the world, weather forecasting remains in an inexact science. A sudden storm can catch even the most diligent forecaster off guard. This is because Earth is a dynamic planet. The atmosphere, continents, oceans, ice, and life are constantly changing and interacting to influence the climate and weather patterns. Section three, measuring changes in climate. Gathering data with dog sleds. The Inuit are people who live in the Arctic region of Greenland, Canada, and Alaska. They use dog sleds to travel over the Arctic sea ice. Sea ice is frozen seawater. It covers 7% of Earth's surface. Sea ice is affected by ocean currents, wind, and temperature changes over the course of a year. In recent years, the Inuit have struggled to maintain their traditional way of life because the ice has become thinner. This makes it more difficult for the dog sleds to move over the ice. The thickness of sea ice is an important piece of climate data. Sea ice helps to keep the polar regions cold and in turn to keep global climate stable. However, it is difficult to measure sea ice thickness because satellites can't directly measure it. To get a true measurement, Scientists have to use sensors that pick up signals from the water beneath the ice. This means scientists have to actually visit areas to get sea ice thickness measurements. 
In 2008, scientists had the idea of attaching sensors to Inuit dog sleds. These sensors, sensors can measure the ice thickness every second as the dog moves over the ice. These data provide scientists with a better understanding of how sea ice is changing in the Arctic in response to warmer temperatures over the seasons and from year to year. The dog sled sensors are just one way that scientists are measuring how Earth's climate has changed over time and how it is continuing to change. Climate change refers to a significant change in the average weather in a location over 30 years or more, including changes in temperature, precipitation, or wind patterns. Earth's changing climate. Earth's climate has been changing for millions of years. There are complex variables that influence the climate at any given time. It depends on how much solar radiation is reflected back out to space and how much is absorbed. If Earth's climate cools, more snow and ice will form. This will cause more solar radiation to be reflected back out to space. This will make the climate even cooler. When the planet begins to warm, snow and ice will melt. This will expose darker colored surfaces and ocean. As a result, less solar energy will be reflected out to space. This causes the warm, warming to increase. These are called feedback loops. A feedback loop is a change in the climate that causes an impact that changes the climate further. This feedback loop is one reason scientists are particularly interested in changes in the Arctic sea ice. Sea ice has a bright, reflective surface, which means it has a high albedo. As a result, 80% of the sun's energy is reflected back into space. As the sea ice melts in the summer, the ocean absorbs 90% of the sun's energy. This causes oceans to heat up, which causes temperatures to rise even more. When sea ice melts, it also affects ocean's salinity because it provides an input of fresh water into the ocean. This affects global ocean currents, making it harder for warm water from the equator to move north, which in turn re affects regional climates. Melting sea ice also affects heat transfer around the Arctic. During the winter, the atmosphere in the Arctic is very cold, while the ocean is warmer because of the ocean's heat capacity. Sea ice separates the atmosphere from the ocean, preventing heat transfer from occurring. However, when sea ice is thin or fragmented, heat can escape from the ocean. This causes the atmosphere to warm, which in turn affects the global movement of air currents. Data shows that the thickness and extent of Arctic summer sea ice have both decreased dramatically in the last 30 years. Scientists are measuring these changes in the Arctic to better understand their causes, how the melting ice is affecting ocean currents, and how these changes affect a global climate. Determining cause and effect relationships is not easy when it comes to climate. To understand this, it's important to understand the difference between causation and correlation. Correlation means that there is a relationship between two variables, but it does not, but it does not necessarily mean that a change to one variable is caused by the other variable. For example, scientists measuring changes in sea ice might also notice a change in the speed at which a particular ocean current is moving. These two variables, changing sea ice thickness and changing ocean current speed, are correlated. However, scientists would need to do more research to prove that the decrease in sea ice thickness actually caused the ocean current speed to change. There are so many factors that influence climate, as well as complicated feedback loops, that it can be difficult to establish which changes are causing other changes. In addition, scientists know that there are natural changes in Earth's climate over time. For example, scientists know that the Earth's history, there have been several ice ages. An ice age is a global climate marked by long periods of cold temperature that cause glacial formation and expansion. However, most scientists agree that human activities are causing Earth's climate to change more quickly than it has in the past. Scientists believe that in recent decades, the most dramatic influence on Earth's climate has been human activities, primarily the burning of fossil fuels for energy. As fuels are burned, carbon dioxide is released back into the environment. Carbon dioxide is a molecule made of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. The greenhouse effect. The reason that carbon dioxide affects Earth's climate is that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. 
Greenhouse gases are molecules in the atmosphere that absorb energy from the sun and warm Earth's surface and atmosphere. Most of Earth's atmosphere is made up of just two gases, nitrogen, 78%, and oxygen, 21%. A third gas, argon, makes up about 1% of the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, water vapor, and methane are also found in the atmosphere, but in such small quantities that they are called trace gases. Nitrogen and oxygen are essential for life, but have almost no effect on warming Earth and its atmosphere. In contrast, even though trace gases make up such a small percentage of the atmosphere, they have a major impact on warming Earths because they act in a similar way to the glass walls of a greenhouse, trapping the sun's energy. They trapped thermal energy from the greenhouse gases is what makes the Earth a livable 14 degrees Celsius, or 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Without greenhouse gases, scientists estimate that Earth's surface would be too cold for life at negative 19 degrees Celsius or negative 2 degrees Fahrenheit. There are natural causes that influence the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. For example, water in clouds holds in some of the heat from Earth's surface because water vapor is the most common greenhouse gas, accounting for more than half of all greenhouse gases. But the bright white tops of clouds also reflect some of the sunlight back to space, helping to cool Earth's surface. Scientists are still trying to figure out how much clouds affect the warming or cooling of Earth's surface. Sudden events, such as a volcanic eruption or a forest fire, can also impact the climate. Volcanic eruptions send ash particles into the environment, blocking sunlight from reaching Earth's surface. This contributes to Earth's cooling. However, volcanoes also release carbon dioxide, which over millions of years causes warming. Even though carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas, many scientists are concerned about it because humans release so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Scientists know that Earth has warmed by 0.6 degrees Celsius or one degree Fahrenheit in the last hundred years. They don't know exactly why, but many believe that the increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are responsible. The more carbon dioxide molecules that are in the atmosphere, the more energy from the sun is trapped, warming Earth's surface and atmosphere. There are many factors that influence how much carbon dioxide people put into the atmosphere. One such factor is geography. Developed countries, such as the United States, often burn more fossil fuels than less developed countries, such as India. Other factors include population growth, economic growth, new technologies such as renewable fuels, changing behaviors, and seasonal temperatures. Rising global temperatures called global warming lead to other changes such as stronger hurricanes, melting glaciers, and the loss of wildlife habitats. These changes are all part of climate change and they happen because of the Earth's air, water and land are all related to one another and to the climate. A change in one place can lead to other changes in other places. For example, as Earth gets warmer, more water evaporates from the surface, becoming water vapor, a greenhouse gas. More water vapor in the atmosphere leads to even more warming, which will lead to more evaporation, which will lead to more warming. Scientists are still trying to understand how this feedback loop impacts global warming. Climate change is a global phenomenon, but it, is very, but it has very local impacts because of its impact on weather systems around the planet. For example, thousands of miles away from the Arctic sits the Maldives, a country made up of more than 1,100 islands west of India in the Indian Ocean. The Maldives is the world's lowest lying country and therefore at risk of ri rising sea levels. Rising sea levels are an effect of climate change, and a sea level rise of just 0.9 meters, or three feet, would cover the Maldives and make it impossible for people to continue living there. Rising sea levels are a result of both the expansion of water with heat and melting sea ice and glaciers. The leaders of the Maldives have turned to engineering solutions to try to reduce the impact of climate change on his country. Remember that engineers use scientific knowledge to design technologies that solve problems. The first engineering solution tried by the Maldives was a seawall that surrounds the country's capital to keep the rising ocean from flooding the land. 
minimizing human impacts with engineering. Other engineering solutions seek to minimize human effects on the environment. For example, many scientists think that Earth's increasing temperature will have a dramatic effect on the water cycle. Data shows that the amount, frequency, and intensity of precipitation are changing around the planet. Many climate models show that precipitation will increase at high latitudes and decrease at lower latitudes. This means that many locations that are used to large amounts of precipitation may experience more drought. A drought is a period of time when rainfall is less than expected. This dry spell can last for a few weeks, months, or years. In response, some local communities have turned to different solutions for conserving water. One example is rainwater harvesting, which involves capturing and storing rainwater. People can then use that stored water for future uses, including irrigation, washing, and flushing toilets. With proper filtration, it can even be turned into drinking water. Filtration is the process of separating solid matter from a fluid by having the fluid pass through the pores of another substance called a filter. Picture a coffee pot. Hot water is poured into the pot where it mixes with coffee grounds. A coffee filter then traps the coffee grounds and allows liquid coffee to flow through. Coffee filters are semi-permeable, pronounced semi-permeable. <laughs> this means that these materials have pores that are large enough for some substances, such as water molecules, to travel through. But the pores are small enough that coffee grounds cannot move through them and so are trapped in the filter. Water filtration works in the same way. Engineers use different kinds of material to filter out contaminants as water moves through them. People have been harvesting rainwater for thousands of years, but it is becoming more popular today in areas that are suffering from years long drought. For example, in the Southwest part of the United States, local communities are encouraging everyone to harvest rainwater. There are several benefits to rainwater harvesting. It can reduce the amount of water needed to draw from public drinking sources such as reservoirs. It can also help to decrease flooding by reducing storm water runoff. There are also some drawbacks that engineers need to consider. If too much water is collected through rainwater harvesting, there will be less water to collect in natural reservoirs, which could further impact the water cycle. There are also design challenges to any rainwater harvesting system. For example, any system needs to allow rainwater to enter, but somehow also prevent evaporation. Wow, I really learned a lot reading climate and human activity. I hope that you learned a lot too. I'll see you tomorrow with the next one. Bye.